हाँ सर हाँ अब भी क्या सर Thank 
you, sir. Thank you, Prasad, sir, uh, for welcoming the guest. Now I request uh, Professor Aarti Deshpande Mukherjee to introduce a short introduction, to present a short introduction of Professor Mark Kevner. Aarti, ma'am. Yes, uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, uh, it really gives me an honor to introduce Professor Mark Kenoyer, uh, who has been, uh, you can say, researching on one of the oldest civilizations in uh, South Asia, that is the Indus Valley Civilization. He is a professor of anthropology at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And he has been researching on various aspects of this old civilization, such as its ceramics, uh, its uh, bead technology or its shell working technology. He has been also carrying a lot of experimental studies. So in, in a way, he has actually brought about uh, the civilization to come alive, you can say, in the 21st century. And uh, he has um, written several articles, authored many books, so he is a very well known figure today and has done immense contribution to our understanding of the Indus Valley civilization and all aspects related to it. So uh, on this note, I think we can start with the lecture, though it's a uh, pre-recorded one. I hope everybody enjoys it and if anybody has any queries, you can always write to him. He's, he is he responds very fast in uh, replying and uh, will surely answer all your queries. Because in this lecture today, we won't be able to have any kind of an uh, question answer session. So uh, please, you can just write to him wherever you want to. Okay, uh, Professor Mohan, then we can start. Yeah, uh, thank you, Aarti, ma'am. Uh, 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 to play the video, the pre-recorded lecture. Vineet? Yes, sir, I'm saying it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Greetings, everyone. This is Professor Knoyer from the University of Wisconsin Medicine. It's a great honor for me to have been invited to present this talk as part of the Deccan College Bicentenary Celebration. I especially want to thank the Vice Chancellor, Prasad Joshi, for the invitation and to the organizers for facilitating this event. My talk today will be on textiles and the basketry of the Indus tradition, archaeological evidence, and historical legacy. Before beginning, I would also like to thank the Department of Archaeology and Museum of the Government of Pakistan and the Archaeological Survey of India and all my colleagues on the Harappa Archaeological Research Project. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about the finds from that excavation. As well as all the colleagues who I work with in India and Pakistan who shared their data with me on the research of the Indus region. I also want to acknowledge the funding from numerous sources and I especially want to point out harappa.com which is a very important web uh, resource that anyone can log into. It's free. You can get uh, all kinds of information about the Indus civilization and many of the images that I'm using in this presentation um, will be uh, available through harappa.com. The area that we're talking about is the Indus, and the Indus Valley itself is linked to many of our surrounding regions. And the Indus civilization has very deep roots, chronologically going back to about 7,000 BC, during what we call the early food-producing era. And I'll be getting my talk, be beginning my talk with the early evidence for fibers and textiles and basketry uh, from that early time period. Uh, but the Indus is also surrounded in historical legacy. Greetings, everyone. This is Professor Knoyer from the University of Wisconsin Madison. It's a great honor for me to have been invited to present this talk as a part of the Deccan College Bicentenary Celebration. I especially want to thank the Vice Chancellor, Prasad Joshi, for the invitation and to the organizers for facilitating this event. My talk today will be on textiles and basketry of the Indus tradition, archaeological evidence, and historical legacy. Before beginning, I would also like to thank the Department of Archaeology and Museums, Government of Pakistan, and the Archaeological Survey of India, and all my colleagues on the Harappa Archaeological Research Project. Uh, I'm talking a lot about the finds from that excavation. 
as well as all the colleagues who I work with in India and Pakistan who have shared their data with me on their research in this region. I also want to acknowledge the funding from numerous sources, and I especially want to point out Harappa.com, which is a very important web uh, resource that anyone can log into. It's free. You can get uh, all kinds of information about the Indus civilization. And many of the images that I'm using in this presentation um, will be um, available through Harappa.com. The area that we're talking about is the Indus, and the Indus Valley itself is linked to many other surrounding regions. And the Indus civilization has a very deep root uh, uh, chronologically, going back to about 7,000 BC during what we call the early food producing era. And I'll be beginning my talk, be beginning my talk with the early evidence for fibers and textiles and basketry uh, from that early time period. Uh, but the Indus is also surrounded by other regions, which we will discuss as we go through this talk. Um, the Ganga of India area, which is where we see later developments of the Indo-Gangetic tradition. The Deccan, where we see important continuities from the Indus and indigenous developments, uh, the Malwa area, Baluchistan, Helmand, and back to Margiana. All of these areas were linked to the Indus, as well as Uman, which is across the, 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 the sea there. So all of these areas were linked, and I will be talking about regions that are linked to the Indus in the course of the talk. It's actually been over 100 years since the earliest excavations at Harappa, and more than 200 years since the site itself was discovered. And ever since the first excavations, both at Mohenjo-daro and Harappa, we had scholars who were finding and reporting about early textiles. Um, the earliest cotton was reported from Mohenjo-daro on the silver jar. This is a photograph of the jar, of the jar itself at the National Museum in Delhi. Um, it was reported by Marshall and studied by Gulati and Turner in 1928. Um, they identified the fibers as being cotton, and they could figure out the counts in the weft and figure out how fine the textile were. They also found another uh, fabric, possibly of cotton, uh, which was not as fine as this one, but it shows that there was different grades of textiles being produced in, in the sites. Um, in the excavations at Harappa, uh, Bartz did not report any fibers being preserved because uh, they possibly the techniques that they were being used for excavation, but he did note that fabric impressions were on faience vessel fragments, and I'll talk about those a bit later. Other scholars who studied the early Indus uh, Fair Service, Walter Fair Service, um, did many surveys in Baluchistan, and he mentioned that linen is found in Baluchistan, but that linen is not found in Indus sites. We'll talk a little bit about this later, but we do have flax. Flax is what linen is made from. Uh, and linen was found in the, the uh, Arab region, the Gulf, Gulf region, as well as Iran. It's found in Shortugai, northern Afghanistan, and Balochistan. And though flax's seeds are found in the Indus, linen itself does not seem to have been produced very widely, and we don't have any preserved fibers of linen. And one of the reasons would be that we have evidence for cotton. And cotton is much more easily produced and processed as a, as a textile than linen, so that may be why linen was not very common in the Indus. The early food producing era is the period of time when people began to settle down. They began domesticating plants and animals and exploiting different resources in different regions. And this is a process that was happening in the areas of the Indus Valley itself, as well as to the um, west in the regions of Luchistan, where we have the site of Mehagar and uh, the excavations by the French mission. We also have new evidence from the other side of the Indus Valley in the region of the Gagar Hakra River of the sites of Birana and Giraur, who were excavated by ASI and the Deccan College, uh, which show early dates similar to what is found in Mehra, but we also need a bit more uh, detail of these the dates coming out. So we can expect similar types of things being found on both sides of the Indus Valley as well as within the Indus Valley itself. And Mahargar is the site where we have clear evidence for early fiber technologies as well as basketry. The 
this is an example of a burial from Madagascar, and at the base of the burial you'll see here an example of a basket that is buried with the dead. This is before the development of pottery, so people were making baskets and coating them um, with bitumen to make them watertight. They were also using them to, to probably hold and roast foods. We also have bone tools that would have been used to make the, you know, the baskets. Uh, we also have examples of woven, woven textiles from Madagascar, and one of them is has black and red color. So this suggests that they were dyeing the textiles. Uh, red could have been uh, made from madder or uh, root, and the black could have been some kind of ferrous, uh, uh, ferrous material, of iron. Um, we don't know the analysis of the materials yet, but this was found in one of the burials from Madagascar. They also may have been using cotton fluff or matting in the burial. So Professor Jarish, when he was talking to me about the site, told me that in many of the burials they found evidence of a kind of a layer underneath the individual suggesting that they had been, uh, kind of a blanket was put in there or some kind of bedding was put in for the people to leave when they were buried. And as I mentioned, many types of baskets were found, mainly coiled and wrapped baskets. These baskets were probably made from grasses as well as different palms. There are two types found in uh, Baluchistan. One is called the Mazari palm, and the other is the date palm, which is the first of the palms that were in this period in 7000 BC, made of wild dates. But both wild dates as well as wild um, Mazari palm were. Um, the studies by Wakan Coast by the French archaeological bishop at the site of Lady Kalat and Shaitu have found clear evidence for the use of the, the Mazari palm as a fiber producing material which was used to make nets and um, probably also baskets. Uh, they found evidence of basketry being used as a foundation material for which you can make bangles. So these are the impressions of a woven basket. Maybe it was rolled up in a basket bangles were made on top of it. We also have um, the actual charred fibers being found from Shahito, and these were possibly net made into a net, uh, maybe for fishing or for catching animals, and you can see the, very, the various twists that they've been able to identify. And they did a microscopic analysis of the um, structure of these of the, the fibers and were able to identify this with the Mazari palm, which is also found growing in the Makran region. Uh, this is a very important type of palm that is also found in Oman, and we find evidence of it being used to make fishing line and other types of uh, fibers in Oman as well. Now, Fair Service in his study uh, collected lots of pottery from many sites. He made impressions of the pottery, which when we had uh, evidence for baskets in it, these are um, studies that he had done using various types of silicone impressions, and plaster impressions, and you can see that there are many different styles of basketry. So some are very, very fine, some are wide, some are woven, some are oiled, uh, indicating a really rich industry of basketry technology, which would have been using different types of fibers. Uh, no one has really gone back and looked at his impressions, studied them very carefully, but um, they, they hold a lot of promise for better understanding basketry technology in this time period. The site of Kiligun Muhammad, where she also excavated, um, they found that some of the earliest pottery was made by putting clay inside of baskets and basically lining the basket with clay and then probably firing it. And this was one of the techniques for making large vessels. These would have been used for storage of grain and possibly also for cooking. Um, in Lue Banner and Swat, we also have evidence that this technology of baskets continues up into what we would call the later Ottoman period. Uh, it's still used in the high, high level valleys of, of Swat, and it's used in much the same way that it was used back during the earliest period. So, very long continuity of technology and the use of coiled baskets as a foundation on top of which pots were made, hand built. Uh, basket itself becomes like a turning device. 
for Mackard, we have evidence of date pits. So this is a, a, a photograph of a pit of a, of a date. The size measurements suggest that it may have been a wild date, or at least a very early form of domestic date that is smaller than the ones that were used later. Uh, and palm leaves continue to be used and associated with date production today. Here you have a man making a little container uh, using palm leaf to make to hold dates, and then women weaving baskets with, uh, with coil technique using date palm. And when you start looking at different areas of Pakistan and Balochistan and India, we have evidence that there are many different styles of basketry. Some is using willow, some is using cane, some are using date and grasses. So this is a field that needs a lot more study for the Indus, and we're only beginning to understand the complexities of these, text, these, these textile fibers. But more importantly, Mahagard has examples of earliest cotton. So cotton was found inside of a hammered copper bead. Now remember, Mahangar at this time, 7000 BC, they did not make pottery. They did not have metal tools. They had stone tools. But they found native copper. They hammered it and made a bead out of it. And then they collected probably wild cotton and spun it and made it into a thread. And that's preserved on the inside of these beads. This was studied by Mulekharat, and they can identify the shape of the fiber and identify it as being different um, uh, forms of cotton, whether it's immature or fully mature uh, fluff. And this is the earliest evidence of the use of cotton in the world. Now, the cotton that was growing in Luchistan in this time is not the same cotton that is found that everyone is using today. So, cotton from South Asia is called cotton uh, Gossypium arboreum. And it's the first domesticated cotton. It has a shorter fiber than the modern cotton that is used today, because the modern cotton grows from a fiber coming from the New World, and it uh, has a much longer form of fiber. Arboreum, the Pacific Arboreum, also does not grow in every different climate zone, and it has a very limited area. And South Asia happens to be one of the areas where it lives. There's another form, uh, Herbacea, which is native to South Africa, and also supposedly spread into Sudan, Arabia, and parts of Western India and Western Asia. And we also have um, evidence of that eventually a New World cotton comes in, and when New World cotton comes in, it replaces all of these indigenous forms. So today, all the cotton that we wear is actually modern uh, New World cotton from, from the Maya region in Mexico. And the ancient cottons of South Asia are very rarely uh, used. One of the only places which they were used traditionally was in Dhaka. And this is the wild, uh, the variety that grows only on the Meghna River. And that was used to make the special Dhaka Muslim that was the finest form of cotton in the world. Herbaceum uh, requires a drier habitat. And it, grew, it spread from Africa into the Indus Valley, and probably into Central Asia, and into China, into northern China. Arboreum, which requires more rainfall, the one that started in Madagascar, eventually spreads through Bengal and into southeastern uh, Asia and into southern China. We know that cotton was traded and recorded in China by about 200 BC or earlier, but it was not widely used, except by some minority communities. So cotton is an important contribution from the Indus civilization, the Indus tradition that was spread from South Asia to the west as well as to the east. What they did with these textiles, we don't really know because we don't have many more fibers preserved. As I mentioned, in Madagascar we have evidence of black and red colored fibers, uh, but we don't know if it was cotton or what kinds of dyes they were using. But I like to look at the pottery, and the pottery tells us that they had very complicated designs that they were probably also making in textiles. So I look at this catchy bag vessel, and I think of the textiles that we see found in Luchistan, Sindh today, and Gujarat. And these are the types of patterns that might have been found on ancient textiles of this, this region. We do have figurines, and the figurines show turbans. And this is a male figurine with a turban that is, has patterns on it. We have women with very elaborate headdresses. 
which include colors, so that may have been woven textile into their hair. And they also have headdresses that have different designs around the outside that also might indicate a form of textile that was used for um, ornamentation. Madagata male figurines often have turbans, and the turbans have patterns on them. And just looking at modern turbans in South Asia today, you have Bhutan wearing a silk turban made in Bhutan. Uh, you also have a Sydney turban with silk and silver threads with different patterns. And I would imagine that the ancient people of Madagata were also using different dyes and different colors to uh, elaborate their textiles and make very, very distinctive designs. We also have figurines that show um, different styles of, of headdresses and different styles of clothing, including pantaloons. Here these are uh, what could be called shawar. Um, these Brahui photograph of Brahui men from Baluchistan, which is not far from Madagascar, show also men, men with very distinctive types of turbans. So turbans and trousers would have been uh, made with these textiles. And to make trousers or shawar, you have to have needles and sewing. That means that the fibers have to be strong enough and then you have to have fine uh, tools, fine, fine needles to sew to make these kinds of textiles or, or clothing. Uh, Luchistan also has, during even the later period, some very elaborate painted pottery, which I think of as being a reflection of probably designs on textiles. And if you, these are from the Nile region with different patterns, geometric patterns, as well as plants and animals. And in Lorelei and Luchistan, you have polychrome vessels and a figurine, which has designs painted along the leg. And when I saw this figurine, the first thing that came to mind were the Sussi churidars that are worn by many women in Pakistan today and in Sindh. And these are especially woven in different parts of, of Sindh, in Shikarpur and Kherpur. And you see the similar patterns also on pottery. So this again it, it accentuates the importance of dyes and different colors woven and woven in special patterns to create really distinctive uh, styles of clothes. So the early period sees the foundation of textiles. That's the period when we see cotton being developed and then possibly sewing and shaping of clothes. But the regionalization period is when we start seeing some expansion. And this is the period which we call the Harappa, the Hakra, or the Ravi phase, and the Kodijian phase. And it extends from around 5500 to 2600 BC. And the Harappa is located in an area which historically has been one of the most important cotton producing areas of Pakistan, in the Valley. And today it also has one of the very, very important cotton producing. So when we began excavation at Harappa, I was really interested in trying to find out more evidence for textiles and fibers, and I was very careful in our excavations to try to preserve anything that might show evidence for textile production. The site of Harappa is about 17 meters high. It's uh, rising above the plain. And fortunately, we were able to find the earliest occupation level, which is found just at the foundation of the site on a natural plain level. And it's in these levels that we found evidence for early pottery making built by hand, as well as early writing, which dates to around 3300 BC. In the excavations that I did in 1996, we made a, a, a trench that went down to the natural soil. And it was a small trench, but we were very lucky to find at the very lowest levels an entirely well-preserved house floor, which had been abandoned and filled with, with sand and, and silt, and preserving on the floor many aspects of daily life. This, um, these levels date to around 3700 BC. And the Ravi phase continues to around 2800 BC. Um, in this floor, we found a hearth, which is located right here. And next to the hearth, a handi, which was sitting right next to the chula. And then on the floor, there were other pots set in the ground. And you'll see from this map that we have evidence of bone tools for weaving or basketry. We have spindle whorls. And we have lots of beads in situ with the fibers. We're still inside the beads. 
So this is an example of a house where you have evidence for household production of textiles and beads and bone tools and spindle whorls that were necessary for manufacturing these objects. These are the beads that were found in situ. So the fiber had, was still inside. Now, I have not taken these beads out of the matrix. They're in the Harappa Museum, so you'd have to go there to see them. Um, but the fiber must traces must be inside it. Someday I'll be able to go back and look at them in detail. Um, we had many loose beads that we found, and trying to understand what size of fiber would have been put inside of these beads, I took some native cotton and spun it. This is hand spun uh, native cotton using a jerky. And this is the size of thread that is hand spun, and you can see that it is a bit thicker than the beads themselves, so it would be very hard to thread it inside these beads. This means that the Ravi people were taking and making much finer threads even than they do today using a charki. Weaving tools are made of bone and they are highly polished. And these would have been examples of different types of bone tools, one on the top, possibly used for basket making, and these possibly for weaving. They have a very high polish on the surface, which indicates that they were probably used for repeated uh, touching against some kind of fibers. We also found some beads from the Ravi phase that have fiber impression on them. Now the question is, why do you take a piece of clay and put a fiber impression on it? And I think this may have been used to make a design on the surface that could have been colored, or simply to make a terracotta replica of what might be a fiber bead. We also have a TC bead from a later phase that is uh, wrapped with threads, and they took thread and wrapped around it, and then fired it. So this would have mean some kind of special uh, texture on the outside. And maybe later on they actually wrap the real thread around it after it's been fired. So we can identify the warp and weft of these and understand the, the density of the fiber. These are quite loose weave. They're not um, very tightly woven, but they and they show some irregularity. So they would have been hand spun. And I began thinking about why would somebody make a clay bead with a fiber impression, and I saw these photographs online of fiber beads. So maybe these beads were clay replicas of what would have been more valuable beads made of different colors of fiber. And women today in Pakistan and Afghanistan do make fiber beads as tassels and ornamentation. So it's possible that these were clay replicas being made by children or being made by somebody to replicate a fiber bead, and it was being made more easily, made, make it made of clay. So this is something that I can only hypothesize on and, and something that we need to check with research. We do have a figurine from the Kodiji phase that shows a woven skirt. And most figurines that are found, the painted design is already removed does not stay on because many of them were painted after they were fired. But this figurine was painted um, with a pigment that was a bit stronger and we were able to preserve it and it did not wash off and you can see that it's woven with a, a checkered design. This woman also has necklaces with lots of beads and probably wearing a tika in the middle of the head which is an example of this ornament that is found typically in Sindh and Gujarat. Uh, parts of southern Pakistan. That pattern of wove weaving is very common in the Punjab today and also in Sin. And they refer to this pattern as case. So here you have it being worn by a man, here you have it being worn by a woman. It's a pattern of weaving where you take two colors of thread and weave it into different shapes. It can be very simple or it can be very complicated and it provides you the opportunity to make some elaborate forms. But to do this, you have to have a special type of, of, a, of a weaving structure. So this means that this would have probably been an upright uh, loom with different types of pedals to move the threads so that you could make these designs. It's not easy to make these repeated designs with the same pattern, identical pattern, unless you have a mechanized uh, loom. So this is something that needs to be investigated more by specialists or weavers, and it's something that I think uh, deserves a lot more research. The spindle whorls from the Ravi phase show different sizes and weights, which suggests to me that they were used to spin different fine
kindness of threat, some fine, some coarse, which could have been cotton, wool, uh, or jute, or other fibers. And we've been able to measure and weigh these, so I would encourage anybody who's doing research in um, spindle whorls to make sure you have weights and sizes so that we can start to compare these data. Um, I, I've been studying this in Pakistan and Oman and other regions. And here you have women from the Kalasha region of northern Pakistan spinning goat's hair and also spinning wool with wooden spindles. So many of the spindles that the Harappans use might not have been preserved. We find some evidence of terracotta spindles, but here they're using wooden spindles and they're able to make uh, very elaborate threads uh, and some very fine using these techniques. Now, I mentioned before that some of the artists had found faience objects with textile impressions on them. And the earliest evidence of faience vessel with impression is from the Kodichi phase at Harappa. So this is an example of the inside of one of these vessels. This is a replica that I made. And you take a ball of cotton and you wrap it with a fiber, a textile, and then you make the faience on the outside. After you fire the faience, the interior is all burned away, but it leaves the impression of the fiber on the inside. So this means that early Kodijian uh, community were beginning to make very nice glazed vessels, but they were using fiber impressions um, or fiber as the interior of these vessels. And here you can see some uh, horse twists, and this is a C twist, and so you can see that they were making different styles of textiles and using them other crafts. During the Kodiji phase, we also have evidence for um, impressions on pottery, which suggests that you know, textiles were being used as a, as a foundation on what top of which pottery was, was, was built. This one has different thicknesses of fibers, and my feeling would be that maybe it's different colors of textile or different they wanted to show a texture of the textile, so they would use thick textile, thick, thick fibers going one way, and thin fibers going the other, and it gives a very interesting pattern. So this is, again, evidence for the complexity of weaving during this quotidian phase. Um, and then you have some uh, fibers that may represent twill or much flatter weave, and this is possibly wool. And I've done some experimental studies to compare uh, the impressions taken from different fibers. I didn't have time to show them all today, but um, that helps us to understand whether it's a wool fiber or a cotton fiber or a jute fiber. During the Kodijian phase, we also find at Harappa evidence for baskets. And this is an oil basket that we discovered in one of the uh, Kodijian uh, street areas. Probably made with palm leaf with grass filling. So you take grass, make it like oil, uh, long strands and then you wrap the grass with the palm fiber to create these baskets. We also have during the Kodijian phase painted wool figurines. So you could take a bowl and you can use nandi or henna and you can make designs on fur. But in Pakistan, in the Punjab, especially when it gets cold in the winter and it's sin, the cattle are very valuable and people don't want them to get cold so they make blankets for them. These blankets are often very beautifully decorated. So when I see these figurines from the Harappa phase, from the Kodijian phase, with designs on them, I think that maybe they have been covered with textiles and that these textiles are reflected in some of the designs that we see on the cattle. And the Kodiji phase also sees the earliest evidence for the use of very, very um, valuable these are a sequence, so this is one centimeter, so this is like basically five millimeters in diameter, the two holes, this one is one centimeter in diameter, with a stipulated, punctuated design. It has a little hook on the back that you can use to sew onto clothing. And these types of ornaments would have been used for decorating textiles. Uh, they would have been sewn onto clothing. This is a Sindhi gudge a woman's dress that is covered with sequins that glint in the sun or at night with the firelight. And you can see here uh, Turkmen children wearing uh, silver jewelry uh, sewn onto their clothing that helps helps them indicate their status, their ethnic identity. 
and Bernal is a site uh, which has very good evidence for the use of silver jewelry during the spelling of the Jewel days. So that's the, found, that's the period when we see many new traditions coming, and all of this sets the foundation for what we will see in, the, in this civilization period when we see the urban centers emerging. So we have major urban centers occurring, Bakigari, Krapa, Meriwala, Manjadoro, Lakanjadoro, Dolavira. These are all big cities. And the big cities would have been supported by smaller towns. And one of the important trade items that was probably moving up and down the Indus are textiles. And this region uh, was also sending textiles to as far as Mesopotamia. And we have evidence of cotton in Oman, which probably came from the Indus Valley, was used for fishing lines, as well as inside of beads. Um, and this is a, a region that may have been one of the important producers of early cotton that was spreading out throughout the West, and eventually through Central Asia into China, and then across South Asia into Southeast Asia. So the Indus tradition urban phase starts at around 2600, but most of our evidence for textiles comes from the middle and late period, which is what we call the Harappa 3B and 3C. And these are the periods where we have the most uh, data that we can talk about. Um, excavations at Harappa were done in all the different mounds and different areas. Um, and uh, I want to especially thank the um, Department of Archaeology of Pakistan for letting us work there. Uh, it was first excavated by the ESI uh, in the 1930s. Uh, a lot of that material is in Delhi, um, and more studies need to be done on the materials collected during that early phase. At Harappa, we found evidence for baskets in every occupation. So we, I don't have, uh, I'm not including all the different photographs, but we have chutai or woven flat mat baskets and mats. We have basketry, we have lots of different styles which indicates that it was a very common technology being developed. We also have fibers that were used in pottery making and possibly pottery repair. And these are impressions found on some vessels that were possibly being made and repaired and the fiber was actually left on the vessel when it was fired. And if in one of these vessels, which you can see that the fibers have been replaced with a very, very fine silica that's burned out from the fiber, but it's kind of, um, the impression is, is found in the, in the clay. And uh, Dr. Rita Wright and her student have identified some of this fiber as being jute. So this is the one of the first evidences for good fi fiber evidence for jute uh, from the Indus Valley. Um, this is an actual jute fiber, which I've charred to make it look so you can see it, this is uncharred and this has been burned. This is actually another fi jute fiber from Arapa on um, the side of the bean. And then these are examples of jute, probably jute fiber from Baluchistan that were photographed by Walter Fair Service. And many of the shirts probably date to the historical period, but it shows a, a wide range of weaves that jute was used to make. So you can have clothing, very fine jute, or you can have very coarse jute used for burlap. And this is an example of what might be a jute uh, fiber impressed into ceramics from Harappa. Moving on to more finer textiles, um, we have very few fragments that have been preserved, but we do have figurines that show that people were wearing textiles in many different forms. And they were wearing it with very, very valuable jewelry. So my argument will be that the textiles themselves are also valuable. You wear, you wear valuable textiles and valuable jewelry to show your status. This woman is wearing a skirt, and on top of that skirt is a carnelian belt with bronze. She's wearing a headdress, probably made of textiles, and she's wearing necklaces that would have had fibers inside them to hold the beads together, and maybe woven with special designs. This is another example of a headdress which has flowers on it. Now, these flowers could be natural flowers, but they could also be fiber fabric flowers that were made to look like flowers using textiles. We have figurines that just have a simple skirt and an elaborate headdress or different types of turbans. Um, the same simple skirt but thrown over the breast is worn even by communities in different parts of India today. Other figurines show very more elaborate forms with decorated headdresses and um, more uh, 
details showing a wide range of styles. And these different styles of headdresses, different styles of skirts, all probably relate to ethnic identity. You can see here that Tika is still worn during the Harappa period, and different styles of headdresses, some of them linked to the Bluchistan style from the Hadagar, um, and then long skirts, short skirts, different types of belts, all combined to help differentiate people within the cities. So cities are places where textiles become a very valuable commodity. People can look at their textiles and know who you are, how much wealth you have, and how much power you have. Some, some of this, the textiles were possibly worn as longer skirts, and this cylinder seal from Kalimanga shows what appears to be a woman wearing a very long skirt. And uh, here's another example of it with patterns. So again, here, this would be a decorated textile. And probably the most famous figure is the so-called priest king. Uh, as, as many of you probably know, this is not a priest or a king. It may be a elite from one community. But this figure, when it was first found in the photograph on the left, shows a reddish pigment on the inside of these trepoil designs. Um, there's traces of what might be a darker pigment in the areas between, and I made this replica of painting it to make it look like what I think it might have looked like based also on the terracotta bangle that we found from Harappa, which shows a green background, red filling, and then a white outline of the trefoil. So this is a bangle with a design identical to what I think may have been on the priest king cloak. So it shows that some textiles were very elaborately decorated and probably had very important ritual meaning. So these symbols are not just for decoration, but they would have had some ritual meaning. Other textiles don't have patterns on them, but they probably were also very well painted and decorated. And some figures have evidence for a turban during the Harappa phase as well. So the concept of a turban being worn by men starts in Madagascar in the early period and continues on into the later phases. Painted pottery in the Harappa phase also shows elaborate designs, which I think probably reflects the kinds of techniques used in embroidery textile decoration. We don't have any examples preserved, but if you look at modern embroidery, you'll see how these same motifs are combined to create peacock motifs and geometric designs that are part of embroidery today. Similarly, we have more figurines in this procession, which is part of the ritual. So the textiles were used in sacred rituals. People would have to wear certain clothing as part of the textiles. And you have hair that is bound in tukta. It's a very long hair, but probably wrapped with tech fibers. Um, these are also examples that should suggest that textiles had a very important role in, in ritual as well. And the people design that we see in the modern textiles was probably also incorporated into ancient Buddhist textiles as well. We have geometric seals. Each of these seals represents a mandala or a form of ritual design, and these designs are also seen in modern embroideries, which most people don't pay the attention to them, but these are actually mandalas. And women who are making these designs often pray and they, you know, they recite scriptures when they're making them so that these objects protect the people who wear them. So these are important things that people tend to forget when you start looking at textiles. Textiles are not simply decoration, but they are also protective and they are meant for um, rich spiritual uh, reasons as well. Now, where do you get all the colors from? So in this region, I've shown you lots of colors with different, different colors, but one of the most important dyes that was developed in South Asia and became very important for trade is indigo, neem. And the, throughout our excavations at Harappa, I was trying to find evidence for dyes and different types of dyeing facilities. And I was very fortunate that when we came to work in the area of the so-called circular platforms, which Wheeler had excavated one, Lux excavated 22 of them, um, but they, the, st the study of these was assumed that they were related to grain. That was because Wheeler misidentified these as grain processing. These circular platforms were not used for grain. They were enclosed in a small room 
If you try to process grain in a small room, you will die of silicosis. You don't do that in a small room. You do it outside in the field. So these were not meant for grain processing. Everybody understand it. So this is the excavated one from Wheeler. He left it, and we came and we re-exposed it and looked at it very closely. We found another one that had been robbed by the Harappans. Now, why would you come and rob something and take bricks from some surface? And we found evidence that people had dug through the surface and dug down to locate this structure and then found the center and excavated the center. And in the center, you can see where they excavated. They dug a pit right here and they took out this clay. They took out the clay up here, but they missed this clay. They left it. This clay is a dark greenish color, which means that it had some kind of organic material in it. And my theory is that these were platforms on which indigo plants were left to ferment, and that this may be the indigo production center. So all of these circular platforms, I don't think were used at all for grain. In fact, there's no evidence for grain processing. All of them have a hole in the center. And my theory is that they were used for processing indigo. Today, indigo is processed in a very wasteful way in India. And this was a process developed during the colonial period. So part of what I'm arguing for is a break away from colonial perceptions, perceptions of the past and trying to understand the ancient Indus process. And indigo traditionally was fermented on platforms that still run in Japan today. Today, the indigo plant is thrown in a pit and very quickly thrashed to get the indigo, and then all of the plant is thrown away. So it's a very wasteful process because the indigo of India is so good, very quickly get good quality indigo by this process. The ancient Indus people may have put them on platforms and fermented them, and they would be in closed rooms so that there's no sunlight, which affects the process, and then that indigo would have been very rich, deep colored blue. So indigo would have been important. So the circular platform area is just over here, and this is the building which is so-called the granary. And it is not a granary. I've excavated a portion of this portion of this area, and we know for sure that this was not used to store grain. And when I was excavating here, a visitor came from Faisalabad, which is a big city west of Harappa, and he asked me what these buildings were for. I said, you know, we don't really know. These are very long, narrow rooms, and we're not sure what they're used for. And he said, well, it looks to me like a, a textile factory. And that made me start thinking, that possibly these rooms were very long rooms for stretching out textiles and stamping them with different colors and processing them and storing them. Because in our excavations, we found no evidence for grain storage or garbage associated with food production like houses. These buildings were not used for housing. They were not used for people to live in. And I think they may have been used for storing textiles, which need to be kept clean and no food items around so that the rats don't eat them and, and nibble them. And this one might have been an important storage area for textiles or preparing textiles for trade. So the Indus Valley was trading, we know, with Mesopotamia with textiles, and cotton coming from these big cities might have been one of the important trade commodities. Textiles can only be valuable and important if you have lots of an, an economic way to produce lots of them. And if you are using spindle whorls, you can produce textiles. And in Mexico, in ancient Mexico, they used spindle whorls. And the Maya were taxed um, for, for textiles. So women in the household made textiles and were part of the taxation by the government. But in the Indus Valley, during the Harappa phase, we don't have very many spindle whorls. We have a few. And they are some very small and some of them very large. And my feeling is that if they were making lots of textiles during the Harappa phase, they had the new technology. And that technology, I argue, is the Turkey. The Turkey leaves no archaeological remains. It's made entirely of wood, except for the spindle, which is made of copper or metal. Today, it's made of iron. So this is the way to make very quickly fine threads, and you can make them thick or thin without by how you prepare them. And it's something that's done in the home. So today in Pakistan, many of the women spin at home. They sell the, 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 the fibers to the local mills, and they make income that way. So throughout this presentation, I've been talking about women a lot. 
So I think that people should understand that textiles is a generally done by women in the household, and it does become industrialized and men become involved at some point, but most of the textile production of the Indus is probably done by women. We do have spindles, or what might be spindles from Harappa, and this one actually has fiber wrapped around it. So this is a bent, broken spindle that may have been used for later in recycle. Uh, but I think that these examples suggest that there, and we have lots of these rods. Many people call them surma nani, or they thought they were for surma, but they're not. These are spindles that were probably used for spinning wheels. So this is the portion that's preserved, and we have them in copper uh, from all the Indus sites. If you have spinning on a spinning wheel, you can produce very uniform fibers. And this is an example of a Harappa toy bed. And when I found it, I was very excited to see all the fiber impression here. So whoever made this toy bed decided that we're going to make an impression of fabric on it and then maybe paint it with some designs. We don't have any colors left, but that fiber, I've measured it, it's very uniform. There's no lumps that would be there if it was hand spun from a spindle wool. This is hand spun on a jerky, and a jerky can allow you to make very uniform thread and very thin thread. So the threads that they were using probably are wool, cotton, jute, and I'm going to introduce a new fiber, which is dasar, silk. So until our excavation at Harappa, nobody had any idea that Harappa was also made silk. I will end my talk today focusing on silk, but let's talk a little bit about these other fibers. So we've already talked about jute, now we're going to talk about cotton. So cotton fibers that we find are preserved sometimes on copper. These are the actual fibers. They're preserved on the copper from the copper salts. And these are similar to those found from Mohenjo-daro. So this is very loose Z-twist, um, and it's an example of a loose weave that was used to wrap something. We also have wool, and some of the wool that we have from Harappa is very fine. Um, wool from sheep is relatively coarse, but some of the fine wool could come from um, Chiru. Chiru is the shatush that's found in Tibet, and I think that some of the ancient Harappans were also probably trading to Central Asia and acquiring some very fine wool. So I'm trying to get some more of these samples for analysis them in Harappa, and I'm hoping to look at this more in the future. We also have a razor. This is a, a copper object that is used sharp on the outside. This one was wrapped with a fiber that I think is a wool. Um, again, it's in the museum, so I haven't been able to analyze it in great detail. But this shape of razor is almost invariably used for making carpets. Now, we have no evidence for carpets from the Indus Valley, but I'm arguing that if, if they were making carpets, they would probably use a razor like this. And they may have made flat weave carpets, flashy, uh, which are found even in Sin and Gujarat today, which is also done with wool. These are flat weaves, but this type of pile carpet is something that one of my students is now investigating, and we're hoping that we can find evidence for this from these early time periods. The discovery of silk was found in 2000 in the excavations in 2000 when we began excavating an area that had been very badly eroded. All of the later levels had been moved, removed by erosion and we were able to find evidence for an occupation level that is just about period 3A, um, which is the beginning of the Harappa phase and the area where we found the silk is the beginning of 3B, so about 2450 BC. We found samples on two sides of the distant area where there was a dump, and these are fragments that were found in, 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 this, in this area of excavation. The fragment that had the silk in it was an ornament. Now, this is a necklace made of wire, made of copper, that has been wrapped very tightly, and inside is a tassel. It's basically a fiber of thread. And Fragments of this I studied separately in Madison, and Irene Good studied separately in, in Harvard. I did not know she had a sample. And I remember calling Richard Meadow and saying, I, I think we have silk at Harappa. I've studied this sample. And he looked at me, he kind of talked to me, said on the phone, he said, 
No, Irene just told me that she thought that it was silk too. So two people independently came to the same conclusion that this is silk. And this is something that I'm continuing to study. Unfortunately, Irene Good has passed away. And I'm the only person who's had an example. I have been able to study these. And we need to continue more work with the samples. But this is a fiber inside of a necklace, which would have been part of a tassel of one very elaborate. So where does silk come from? Silk comes from a moth. And the moth that is found wild is called Bombax mandarina. It's found wild in India. It's found wild in China. In China, that, that moth was domesticated and the wings were stretched such that it was not able to fly anymore. And that Bombax mori is called, is the domestic silk. In South Asia, it's very possible that that same domestication process occurred. But everyone assumes that if it's Bombax mori, it came from China. We also have in both China and in India, other types of wings, and they are, one is called Tassar, the other one is called Eri or Indi, and the other one is called Uga. So these are three different varieties of so-called wild silk, but all of them have been impacted by human cultivation. So even though they are technically wild and that they fly and they can fly away, whereas Bombax Mori cannot fly away, all of those species have producible silk. This is tassar from oak trees in China. This is tassar from various types of trees in India. Actually, I took this from a, a bear tree from outside my kitchen when I was a teenager. And these are eri that grows on um, castor bean. This is red eri, and this is boga. These are Cam Cambodia bambax mori, which is a yellow color. It turns white after it's, it's, it's processed. And this is bombax mori from Assam. These are examples of the small size of a cocoon of bombax mori and the large size of a cocoon from the wild silk cocoon. Now, processing this results in different qualities. You can reel it or you can let the, the, the moth come out. This is called piece silk because they don't kill the moth and then they have to spin it by hand. When you kill the moth, this makes the silk impure according to later Buddhist traditions where monks were not allowed to wear silk that had been made by a moth that had been killed. So you have to let the moth come out of the, the cocoon and then you can wear this silk because it's made by letting the moth live and then you can take the silk. And so this type of silk is called piece silk. Now in Harappa we also found a, another razor. This one is a different kind of razor for shaving probably. Uh, but it's wrapped in fiber that I also identify as silk, which means that Harappans were making silk for tassels, but they were also making it into fibers that were woven. And this fiber was used to wrap up a piece of broken metal that was going to be sold to some kavar and then recycled. So they were using silk in everyday activities. There's some more details. I realize I'm going a bit long here. Um, this is an example of a tassel inside of a hollow bangle. So we have it in a necklace wrapped around a piece of textiles, wrapped around a piece of metal. And then this one is on the inside of a bangle, which would have been, again, a tassel in a bangle. Now, these are microbeads found from the site of Chandaro. And inside of them, we have evidence for, according to um, Irene Good, is where they were found in Chandaro, silk inside and she identified this silk as being a muga or possibly a. So these are examples of silk from different contexts. Now we're still doing many studies of silk, but the important point is that Harappans had silk, and this was probably one of the most elite forms of textiles being produced. I've looked at some other Chanodawa beads that may have uh, possible cotton inside of them. So sometimes they may have been using cotton, sometimes they may have been using silk. Now, where is silk grown today? Today, this is a map of India showing all the major silk producing areas. And the Indus Valley is basically, or the, I mean, the Indus, Pakistan is basically empty. It hasn't been included. But just north in, in Kashmir, you have silk production. And it's possible that silk might have been produced in the area of the upper Indus Valley, or even 
Cotton is grown in other regions. So we have cotton, main cotton producing areas, which are very important. Gujarat is one of the most important areas today for cotton producing. But in Pakistan, Harappa is also very important. So Harappa is, it has enough rainfall and produces summer cotton that is really important. Um, so those are the foundations for the Indus textiles. And then what happens in the later Harappan period, uh, we, we are still investigating. I don't have a lot of detail on it. And I'm going to jump from the later Harappan into the early historic to show a little bit about the legacy. But we do know that the late Harappan period, we have connections between the Indus region and into the Deccan area and Diamondbad is one of the furthest sites to the south. And here is where the Deccan College comes back into the play, because when the Deccan College began ex excavating areas in the areas of Maharashtra, which associate with the Jorway culture, they found evidence at Chandoli for flax. They found evidence at Navdatoli for cotton. And most importantly, in the Navasa excavations, uh, directed by H.D. Sankalia, they found evidence for silk. Silk and cotton mixed together. And when you mix silk and cotton together, it makes a special type of textile. And uh, I'll explain that in a minute. So silk fibers were used in a copper bead, and we also suggest that this was very fine. So these are ex examples of the beads from Navasa that are still in the Deccan College collection. New studies need to be done on this, so I would encourage people to re-examine the beads, re-examine and re-photograph these fibers so that we can learn more about them. After the Indus period, we have a, a transition leading up into what I call the Indo-Gadgetic period, beginning with Vedic, uh, painted gray ware, northern black polished ware, and then we have the early uh, chief, uh, chieftains and city-states that link to the Achaemenid Persian Empire and then the invasion of and then the Mauryan Empire. So this is a period of time that I'm going to just briefly talk about regarding, regarding the, the textiles of the later period. And I want to focus on silk. So the earliest silk references in texts, which were noted by many Indian scholars in the, even in the 20s, um, are noted in Banani's grammar, Sabyai. Um, Banani lived in Bandara, near the Indus and Kabul rivers, near Peshawar. He did not live in the Benga region. So he was familiar with this area, and so his area of expertise was Bengal, north, northern what is now Pakistan. In the Astadhyayi, he mentions different types of silk. Patta, Patu, which were textiles commonly thought to have come from the east, from Assam or Bengal, or possibly Central Asia. He also mentions Kaushaya, which is silk or silk worms. But importantly, he also mentions Chinam Sukha. And Chinam Sukha is supposed to come from Chin, China, which means China. And now the question is, when did the word Chin be associated with China? Um, and I'm not going to go into the details here, but basically we don't really know. There are many different theories, and we can just assume that when they say Chinam Sukha, it means something related to China. Uh, in the Arthashastra, we also have evidence for these Kosheya, China Patta, China Sukha, Patta, Patta Sukha, China Koseya. So it means that some Chinese silks were like Indian silks, some Chinese Indian silks were like Chinese silks. There may have been some mixture between the two regions, and the names became quite confused. We know in the laws of Mun, in the Manu Dharma Shastra, that there were many different regulations for textiles. And silk production was important. So this is something to do during the time period of 200 BC to 200 CE. People who made silk, there was encouragement, there were incentives, people were encouraged to do this. There were special charges, and silk was more costly than cotton, and some fine wools were the most valuable. There were also different punishments for if you steal silk, you're going to have this punishment. If you steal cotton, you'll have that punishment. So these are things that became important parts of law codes. We also have references to silks, different types of textiles. And when you have cotton and silk together, it makes for a different feel in the way the textiles fall. So some people think that the alasha textiles, these are the types of uh, uh, ikat weaves, might be combinations of silk and cotton. And we know that mushu, which is a type of silk produced in the 15th to 17th century in Gujarat, 
is silk and cotton because in Islamic tradition, men should not wear silk on their body. But silk is nice and pretty, so if you weave the textile with the cotton on the inside, the silk on the outside, then you can wear the textile. And that's many of the turbans were made that way with much loop. So that way you can wear a silk turban, but you're not really touching the silk to your body. So these are important pattern uh, processes that were being developed. But it's important that many different types of silks were being produced, and that not everything made of silk comes from China. We know that silks from India were being sent to China. We know silks from Iran and Central Asia were coming to India. So silk was a commodity that was produced in many different regions, and each region had its specific variety and also a style of weaving during the early historic period and the periods of time when we have beginnings of trade with the Roman Empire. So everyone assumes that the Romans were trading with India and that they were getting Chinese silk from India. And this comes from one single text that has been misinterpreted for many, many years. This is called the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. And it refers to products from India, was written by a trader from Egypt who came by boat and he came all these regions. And he mentions that he was a Greek-speaking trader who says that from India they collect the Othonia serica. Othonia means linen. That's the word for linen in Greek. They had no word for silk. And they called the place Ceres. Now, we don't know where Ceres is. Some people say it's China. But we don't really know if it's China. It could have been Central Asia. And these traders, for whatever they were, they were not linguists, and they were using whatever term that they knew, and they were just calling it silk of linen of Ceres, and they were saying that this is what they were getting from Badi Gaza, Zidis, and the India ports. All the scholars have assumed that this is Chinese silk. I would argue that they need to rethink based on the Indian textual references, the fact that we have silk from the Indus Valley, means that silk was already being produced in many different forms in South Asia, and silk from Central Asia and Iran was also probably coming into this region, and that this region was a marketplace where many different varieties of material were coming. So when it comes to trade, what was the role of South Asia and Central Asia in silk production and trade to the West? New research is needed to clarify the nature of silks, silk processing as well as other textiles. We can't just assume that it's silk is from China. We have to say that it's silk, it's from South Asia too, and also cotton is a very important textile. And I want to conclude my talk with the, the, emphasizing that the fragmentary of nature of textiles have left, have left their history and the people who produced them understudy. We need to know more about the women and the children who were involved in textile production. We also have to develop new analytical technologies and more excavations are needed to fully understand the many contributions of the Indus tradition and textile to later traditions in South Asia and the world as a whole. I want to end by encouraging scholars to find new ways to study the past. Thank you. Professor Kenoya for giving us this very interesting lecture 